Welcome everyone to today's live webinar. We're so excited you can be here for Turning Vistopia into Powerful Action for Change with Dr. Claire Mann, author and psychologist. We will go into more detail about what Vistopia is and all of the different facets of that. But for now, I would love to introduce you to VegFund, the organization that's putting on today's webinar, and the organization that provides lots of different resources and activist learning series uh, productions for vegan activists like yourself. My name is Leah Gage, and I am the program officer at VegFund. And that means that I review applications, look at different activist work, and work with activists in order to support their activism to spread veganism throughout the world. VegFund is a nonprofit organization that provides grant funds for lots of different kinds of vegan activism. For example, we fund food sampling, we'll fund the costs related to hosting a screening of a film or a documentary, including the license fee and maybe event-related costs. We fund pay-per-view and video street outreach, uh, uh, costs related to veg fests and vegan fairs. We also fund other kinds of training materials like today's presentation, panels, conferences. We even fund more innovative projects like a uh, vegan fashion show or vegan restaurant weeks. So uh, if you don't already know VegFund, I would encourage you to go to our website, VegFund.org, and see if the work that you're already taking at to carrying out on a daily basis might be eligible for veg fund funding. In addition to funds, veg fund also provides resources and helpful materials for vegan activists. Um, we will talk a bit about the, the plight of vegan activism and what it can mean for us and how isolating it can be. And so to that end, veg fund has tried to create a body of work that you can access at any time for free to help you with your activism, to help you with your vegan journey. Um, so I would encourage you to visit our resources section. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to this site as soon as it's complete. Um, we have lots of other presentations like today's that have also been recorded and uploaded, so I would encourage you to take a look at that website. Um, we also have a community forum that you and anybody else can sign on to. We have one specifically for VegFest organizers and one that's broader for all different kinds of vegan activists. You can find that if you look on our website and see community up at the top, you can click there and that will take you to our community forum registration. But so related to this, something that we hear so often from our grantees is the need for resources to support activist burnout. And any activist, really anybody, experiences burnout, but there is a particular kind of burnout that vegan activists can experience. And that's something that our presenter today, Claire Mann, has really become an expert in. It's something she has called Vistopia, and she's going to go into that more. Um, so we, we really hope that today's presentation can be a resource for you can help take you to the next level, give you that boost that you need. And with, with that, I'm so excited to introduce Claire Mann. She is a psychologist, existential psychotherapist, author, and communicator. She's the author of many books, including Vistopia, The Anguish of Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. And we are so thrilled to have her today. So Claire, thank you so much for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Hi there, thank you very much, Leah, and um, welcome to everyone. I'm calling in from Sydney, Australia. I'm just getting my screen completely ready here. And many of you I may have met because I spent some time in the States last year at the Animal Rights Conference 2018. I should be back there again this year. Um, and of course, in, in webinars and, and other talks and things. So without further ado, um, when I was asked to do this, I met this wonderful team of Veg Funds, um, and what a fabulous initiative. Met you when you were, of course, in Los Angeles last year. And when I was asked to do this, I thought a lot of people may have tapped into previous webinars. So yes, I am going to talk about dystopia, but particularly pull out four areas that are particularly pertinent to, which cause us even more angst, particularly when we have to deal with the non-vegan world. And then sometimes we have problems with vegans too. We've actually got an hour and a half. I'll probably speak for much less than that, and there'll be time for questions. But I'm also going to give you um, some interaction as well. 
So I've just got a little technical help to my right here. So I just, without further ado, I'm believing this is now going to change. Perfect. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do to start is to just introduce the notion of existentialism, because I don't know if everybody has heard the term dystopia, and I'm going to go through what that is in a moment. But in order to understand that it is a Everyone, everyone really knows about it from experience. When you become a vegan, basically your whole world changes. And we know that from the inside out, everything that sort of we held to be true or we believed in or we were interested in, suddenly this veil of the systematized abuse of animals and then all the other things we think, well, what don't we know, changes the way we look at things. So I don't know if we've got any existential philosophers on there, but existentialism, I believe, is a, a wonderful way to try and explain not only our experience, but to try and understand the non-vegans experience of so them trying to cling to a world that is not really objective, but it's what they know. And anxiety comes when we learn that actually things aren't fixed and solid. And we have all sorts of strategies to avoid that. Um, jobs, marriage, families, um, countries. These actually are just social constructs. Yes, you know, we, we get on a plane and go to Spain or something, but how do we know we're there? What does it mean to be Spanish? It's very, Spain is very different to the person visiting than the person that was born there. These, But we, we come to think of these as objective realities. And the reason I've introduced this to start is to say when we understand our experience and that of the non-vegan against the backcloth of this, it's much easier for us to to actually communicate the imperative of veganism and also to deal with our pain and frustration of, of living in a world that doesn't seem to care. So to give you an example of that, and I'm going to go to a couple of slides introducing this before I actually explain what dystopia actually is and whilst it, why it is such a challenge, is you can see teal coffee here. And a wonderful way to, um, something that underpins existentialism is the whole notion of choice. Now we hear this a lot when we're talking about um, veganism and animal rights. People say, I've got a choice, I can eat what I want. You choose your life, I choose mine. But what does choice actually mean? Usually we're choosing from a very limited diet of things, veganism or non-veganism in, in the person's eyes in the discussion. But actually the existential view, the philosophy of what it is to exist, is trying to explain that we always have choice. Even when we're not choosing, we are perhaps choosing not to choose. And I use this wonderful example of tea or coffee. I come from the south of England. And when I was a young girl, there was that lovely family story, as we all have family stories. And my mother would say to my father, Vic, would you like tea or coffee? And my dad sometimes would answer, but invariably he would say, I'll have the same as you, dear. I was born in that sort of era. My dad's actually 95, he's still alive. And my mum would say, well, Vic, what do you want? He said, well, look, you know, I don't care. And she sometimes would be a bit naughty and suggest he had a gin and tonic instead. And it was only nine o'clock in the morning and it'd be a bit of a chuckle. Um, or she'd get frustrated and say, look, you choose. And then she would make it. Sometimes he'd be happy, sometimes he wouldn't. But I remember as an eight-year-old child looking up at my parents and my father saying, no, I'm not going to choose. I, I don't care. And I had that realization that my dad was not not choosing. He was choosing not to choose. OK, and that's the basic tenet of existential choice is we are thrown into a world. We come to know our family, our culture, our beliefs, our schools. And we tend to think, oh, this is my beliefs. This is who I am. And we tend to see it like a fixed thing. Obviously, we come into veganism and the whole world changes. But we can be very stuck on a lot of everyday things. When we say this is how things are and this is how it should be, we are cutting off the possibility of other things. And then we're not coming into the world of other people. I'm trying to do an existential and 101 very quickly. It takes years to really grasp the, the richness of it. But I want, once we understand that it's all about, we come to know our world, we try to make it fixed. We think we have choices between certain things. And sometimes we go along with society. We go along with our personal beliefs willful ignorance. We hear that a lot when we're talking about veganism. But in fact, we all do it to some extent. We have a fixed view. We say this is how things should be. So whenever we hear the word should, ought or must, I should do something, I ought to do that, ought to go home for Christmas, um, a good daughter-in-law would do this for a mother-in-law, anything that is fixed, it's actually just a choice because there's a lot of other people that don't do that. They do something else. Now, when we realize that it causes us anxiety when we realize the world isn't fixed. Um, 
as we know, becoming vegan, the world changes and we try to explain and people don't even see it sometimes. When we realize it causes anxiety, we are better able to understand the resistance of others. And whilst we want to, we get so upset when people won't change or they, you know, our family won't even look at the videos, we want to watch them because it causes people anxiety, not just about the material, about the fact that they believe the world was a certain way. They believe the government was good to them. They believe that education was a sound system. And then they have to see something else. It causes, some people can tolerate it, some can't. We have different abilities. All right. So um, I'm just going to move my slide a little bit because I can't quite read this. Now, I know it's a lot of writing on here. and my slides aren't covered with writing. These are just the first few. But if you can really grasp it, you'll be able to come into our world, but also the non-vegans more. So when we're called, Rollo May was an existential writer. I'll read it out slowly, even though I imagine you're trying to read it. He says, when we're called upon to do something new, to confront a no man's or no woman's land, to push into a forest where there is no well-worn paths and from which no one has returned to guide us, we will experience anxiety. This is what existentials call the anxiety of nothingness, that the world isn't fixed. To live in the future means to leap into the unknown, and this requires a degree of courage for which there is no immediate precedent and few which, which people, few people realize. Now, to understand the enormity of that is the majority of people have very similar lives. Over their lifespan, over the 40, 50 years, people do very similar things. They use words like, I'm getting older. I could have done that when I was younger. These are fixed beliefs in the fact that we get older, we age, we don't take choice chances. And of course, when we see someone else do it, we see two amazing raw um, plant-based diet people break all records for running marathons when they were nearly 70. People say, oh, well, they must have a different blood type. Or it's, is it because they're just being a bit cynical about those people? Or is it because if they have to grasp that they could do something, someone else can do something different, so can they. And therefore, that anxiety comes is that they're not choosing to have the existing way or get older, accept it. They're choosing not to choose that there are infinite possibilities. I hope that makes sense and it will set a little bit of context. And then I have to move my side again. Martin Heidegger. Now, he has a bit of a mixed um, background. We won't look at some of his uh, political views, but he says, um, we can either go along with the crowd, and vegans aren't doing that, and animal activists. We can either collude with the, man, the demands of what he calls the they self. In other words, society. This is how everybody does it. The world of others and our perception of their expectations and social conventions. Or we can heed what he calls the call of conscience and become aware of our choice of how to be against the backcloth of our temporary, our temporal existence. So in other words, he says the people that choose meaningfully how to live their lives rather than going along with the, the crowd are the ones that will experience anxiety, but we can live in a more enriched way. Doesn't mean just vegans make these choices. Of course they don't. But I think veganism is something that changes everything in one's life and also holds the, the promise. And I think it would deliver on every of our social, economic, personal, spiritual challenges at the time. So if we understand other people's anxiety, we're going to be able to change our language. And when we have better conversations, we feel we're making a difference for the animals. A lot of our anxiety actually gets reduced. So this is a very quick exercise. I know we've got a fair bit of time before I actually get into dystopia. Is, you know, there's critical events in our lives that have influenced our life direction. Think back on some of the things that have influenced you. OK, let me have a little look. Oh, I'm just going to move us back there, is it may well be that, you know, I remember climbing, a, going on a walking holiday once to Italy, and I got, I suddenly became very aware that I really didn't like heights, and I clung to the side of this small mountain, and I had to be rescued. It was such an overwhelming sense of anxiety, but I'm telling you about it now, because I came back and realized, started to question, you know, what was I afraid of? Other people were climbing up there like mountain goats. And I started to look at where had I become fixed by saying a statement like, I don't like heights. When we fix anything, I don't like heights. I'm not creative. I'm not artistic. We fix ourselves. Remember, other people are doing this too. But think about those critical instances. Maybe it's when you had a, you, you've met someone who's very important in your life and something really changed. I'll just go back to this little exercise. And you might want to do this a little bit later, just to grasp our, our choices and where 
things can happen outside of veganism that actually change us so much. So imagine you you um, you were asked to give a pen picture, get a pen and paper of some critical events or things that influence your life direction. What would they include? They could be a conversation with a stranger or at a train or achieving a lifelong ambition. The experience made you feel you were really you really learned something or running at 100 kilometers an hour. OK, write down those key events that you feel have influenced your life. Now, this is a really good exercise because it we tend to when we have, you know, significant things that happen in our lives and someone's sadly it's through illness or job loss. It seems the worst thing in the world at the moment, at time. But later on, we think if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't have opened up in a new way. OK, I always say there are good things that happen in life and bad things. Sometimes it's not to the end of our life. We get to, to see which is which. All right. And the reason I have to say, you know, the reason I'm suggesting this to you, we're trying to understand ourselves. We're trying to sound others. Now, for a lot of people, this thing that really influenced our life, of course, is the awareness of animal social justice and, and veganism as in, as in moral and health and environmental imperative. But it's a good exercise to do. So things influence. OK, now, how is it relevant even thinking about these choices? Because it's for us to understand the existential nature of choice, the philosophy of what it is to exist. I'll give you a little, little brief thing, because I always feel when I'm talking about existentialism, it's kind of really easy, that tea or coffee example, but it's kind of heavy European philosophy in many ways. The, uh, it, the whole premise of existentialism is that our existence precedes our essence. In other words, we come into life and we come to know ourselves. A lot of us then get fixed and you know modern psychology methods actually fix even more and say this is your fixed personality but the existent the other view of life is often that our essence precedes our existence genetics predicts who we are our um so for instance say someone with a religious belief might say a person is created in god's own image in other words there was a, an impression that had was known before the person is born they come into being and it's known what they'll turn out to be if somebody um, creates, say, crafts beautiful pens in a, in a factory. They have it in their mind what they want that to be like, and then they bring it into existence. So the essence of the pen precedes existence. For the existential, it's the other way around. Now, what is the relevance of this in understanding veganism? We are inviting the world to have a completely different paradigm shift, and they are clinging like anything despite all the scientific evidence of being most healthy um, consideration they could take in their life, to being kind and compassionate and environmentally sound, they will resist it. It's because people deny they have choice. They say, this is how it is. I can't choose. We've always done this. This is my traditions. By understanding a little bit more about existentialism, we are going to be able to come into their world, but also let's start to understand our own a little bit as well. So against that little backcloth, a little background, I want you to ask yourself, well, where am I on my vegan journey? All right, we've got a lot of good news around at the moment. There's The Economist magazine. It's not one that I read, but I do when this is the front of the magazine, I, I, it alerts my attention. Just only last month, or in the month of January, it said that 2019 is poised to be the year of the vegan because of the massive uptake in demand for vegan products, which far outweighed the growth in demand in other products should make us feel positive. Many of you will know about this initiative, which I very much support, called One Million Dollar Vegan, where this beautiful young lady I met last year, Genesis Butler, 12-year-old, has is working with people around the world, has gone to see the Pope in the Vatican, and implored him to go vegan for Lent. Because if he's an environmentalist, you know, there is, values have to be aligned. Now, whether some people agree with that um, sort of strategy to do this, seeing it's a bit reductionist. Others will say, well, if this person is going to affect over a billion people, um, I personally think we, we need to do that for the animals. So we've got lots of positive news at the moment, okay? We're seeing more cubes of truth. We're seeing people, people take to the street. We are seeing direct action everywhere. We are, I've seen since the advent, particularly of Dominion, which was the Australian version of Earthlings, and some of the amazing documentaries that are coming out by the month, enormous increase in people in every day in our media in Australia there's something on veganism okay but also I've seen more arrests I've seen more protests I've seen more shutdowns 
and all this sort of form of civil disobedience, we are up against a challenging time. So it, it's whilst we're on the positive side, where are we with this? How hopeful are we really? Now, I don't know who's watching this today, but I know a lot of you are, um, you know, one sense hopeful, but another part says, well, they've got all these plant-based people coming. Is, are these people really going to change? What about the recidivism rates? What about the fact that we're told 85% of people will return to being a non-vegan? Um, what about this powerful action by meat and livestock industries to counter all the amazing news we have about veganism? So what I'm going to do today, and I'm, I'm also aware of time, I'll move quite quickly on this because we also have a recording. I'm going to look at these four areas, and I'll move quickly as I say, is I'm looking at the dystopia and the burden of knowing, the challenge, the burnout that results. I'm going to look at that sort of business and ethics debate, and whilst we have a lot of good news coming, um, you know, what else? What is the bigger picture? How do we escape this so we can be doing more of the work we want to do? Let's have a quick look at recidivism rates because that's been big in, in social media at the moment. And then how do we deal with that awful pain we feel when we found we feel like we found our family? And then there's all this infighting somehow. People will criticize other people. And I am um, the news out there about um, Vistopia, um, a lot of people have resisted that vast majority haven't and said, gosh, at last we've got a name. So let's start with these. And let's for those people who don't know what Vistopia is or those who know, let's do a bit of a refresher. <clears throat> it's the name I've given to being vegan in a non-vegan world. There's a quick recap. You know, we we carry along perhaps pretty OK. <laughs> you know, we've got the normal challenges of life. We've got work and relationships and self-image and and then we throw on this burden of knowing because one day we lift the veil on the truth. Something happens. Everything changes. OK, there's a little bit one challenging image here. It comes coming up in a moment. We became vegan. That's what happened. And we suddenly become aware of the systematized cruelty towards animals in our world. Things that we kind of, you know, we everything was we were duped in many ways, as we know. And, and we're trying to explain this to other people, too. We see cruelty everywhere. We can't walk into a shopping mall and, and just walk past a cafe without seeing somebody put normal bovine growth serum into their coffee. And then we feel the pain of that because we understand what's happening to animals. We don't see a, a cashmere sweater and a jumper. We, we don't see glamour. We see cruelty behind closed doors. So our world is changing. But then it gets worse because we think, well, if, as soon as we tell people and we show them what we've seen, we show them the videos, surely they will become vegan. And every vegan believes that. And of course, they don't. And so this really causes a huge additional pain because not only have we got this burden of knowing, we've now got the fact that people are going to say, don't tell me what to do. Don't preach to me. If you manage to navigate through that, you find yourself a nice vegan family, you do some of the, the work to be part of the solution. Perhaps you're able to, um, you've been around people or your skills are such that you're able to communicate quite effectively or your family come on board. But some people don't fare as well. But even if you do, you know, because the ethical vegan, they're not going to go back, is the bigger pictures there, of course, because we say, well, if I didn't know about that, what else don't I know? And then everything we see from our government, our military, um, information that we're told about wars, about health, about vaccines, we start to see lies everywhere. We see deception. We see greed. We see the pursuit of profit at any cost because where animals are used is mere commodities in the system. And then we start to see consumerism. So suddenly plastic bags bother us. I mean, it should sort of bother us before, but even more so because we see the videos that other people dare not to see. So what happens, and I've, I called this Vistopia, just let us read this. It's an existential crisis, that shift in reality, arising out of awareness of a trance-like collusion with what I call a dystopian world. You can see the definition there. So basically, what is Vistopia? Vistopia is the anguish we feel at knowing about the systematized cruelty towards animals. And then when we tell people, almost this trance-like collusion with a dark and corrupt world in many ways that they don't even know they're part of with their consumer choices. But then, as we say, gosh, if we didn't know about the billions of animals and the trillions of fishes suffering and being killed for us every year, what else don't I know? And then we're called a conspiracy theorist. So our anguish increases because we are so alone. OK, it's this awareness of the greed, the ubiquitous animal exploitation in this modern dystopia. And everyone else is um, 
they go back on their existential resistance to choice and they say we've always done it like this you can't tell me what to do they're saying i have choice but actually it's my right to choose they're not really choosing because their choice is bounded by their culture their society their sedimented beliefs existentialism in our us breaking that trance gets them to realize that they are choosing not to choose they're buying in to what they have ever been taught the vegan is daring to get out of their comfort zone and so many people say gosh i wish i didn't even know what i know but i can't unknow it and i need to act all right so this gives us a little thing so very briefly for those who haven't seen any of the survey i did a very large survey and um, i've been searching vegans for 10 years I've been suffering from this challenge, which made me look and ask questions more. And these were some of the stats. I've just pulled out a couple of them. 83% of vegans said they've suffered dystopia and anguish. No one gets upset too much about it until they've got a fussy diet. What they get upset about is people colluding with the, the cruelty that we know about. And 59% said they were the only vegan in the family. And that's particularly hard for young vegans and teenagers that don't have as much you know, opportunity at the moment, perhaps, to get out and be with others. And 63% um, feel only comfortable when they're around other vegans. Okay, And some of the emotional reactions that you may resonate with, I felt all of these. And I'm now going to share some strategies with you to how do we do something about that, which is the most important. Understanding is the first part. There's grief. There's frustration. We feel alienated. Um, things that used to work never don't work anymore. Things that we saw as entertaining suddenly become trivial. And, and how can we waste our time when the job is so big? But there's a loneliness from groups we previously felt part of. Um, I find people can talk about a lot of rich things beyond animal the work they're doing with animals or veganism. And um, when they're with people, they know are being part of the solution. If not, they see it as trivial and they want to be sharing the message. So there's often a despair and hopelessness that things will never change. I want to change that for us today because, yes, there's lots of things happening, but there's things we must do. We must do with our um, not only what we say, but our actual neurology affects the outside world. So we don't want to be perilous, but this is some of the reactions. Oh, just trying to move us across. It's been very naughty at the moment, so I'll just click on there. It says, oh, there we go. So this was some of the survey. I've shown you some of these. These are terms known to psychologists and counselors all over the world. But what I needed to do was to, to share a word that was going to challenge the medical authorities. Look at some of these titles. Now, a lot of these, of course, result in people then getting medicalized. OK, so not addressing it is very important if we don't put in place exquisite self-care strategies and enhance our communication so that every conversation we have, we feel we're nudging people in, not, in the right direction, not despairing. If not, this is the sort of thing that actually results. Now, I put in place a lot of strategies for myself. There's lots of videos I have to see when I'm talking about things or I'm seeing and, and I do do the things like the Cuba Truth and I get very active. And it's never going to be OK. But having self-care strategies that enable us to filter that grief, is, as um, the director of Earthling says, Sean Monson, when I spoke to him at the conference last year, if not, it stays in the body. We do become burnt out and depressed. OK. Why a new name? Because actually we needed to have something that could quickly grasp the enormity, the awareness and the anguish ourselves, dealing with the dystopian world, and then these bigger conspiracy questions that aren't conspiracies, many of them indeed. We needed a way to explain that to people. But for me, I needed to tell the medical authorities that it was an existential crisis when we wake up and know we've been duped. And then actually we are just buying into what we were told and eating what we're told and, and not taking any ownership and responsibility truly for our choices when we lift the veil and so I wanted to avoid medicalization because I saw so many psychiatrists starting to say that we had um, social adjustment disorders because we wouldn't eat with other people or self-harming because we were watching these videos and sharing them. And that's a very slippery slope. So that's why I've named this. It's not my word. It's our word. And I hope it gives us a, a power to stand up to people that say, well, there's no scientific evidence for this. You know, do we have scientific evidence for, for happiness or hopefulness or inspiration? You know. We know it's a real felt experience. When we've got a word, we can actually find a way out of it as well to transmute that into powerful action for change. So how are you dealing with this? If I could interact with you, um, I perhaps would be hearing some more. And I'm, I know Leah's 
taking some of the chat items. We can look at that in a moment. So for some people, they stay in the trauma because what happens is when we hear this, we see these images, physiologically, our bodies go into fight or flight. We can end up hating people. And um, we can do what is called living in the red zone. I'll share a little bit of neuropsychology with you in a moment. Um, and within it, of course, the solution. The red zone is when our blood flows to the back of the brain and we're unable to galvanize words effectively to communicate to other people, but also we're not able to self-soothe ourselves and bring ourselves to a level of, of care. Half the time, we don't even know we're there. It's all sorts of physiological reactions. So let's have a little bit of this. So we're looking at this first one, which is really about dystopia is then you some and i don't know if we've got any neuroscientists here but neuroscientists roughly agree that there are three different parts of the brain we've got the front part of our brain which is our frontal cortex and we can see that on the left which is our blue zone it's just a, a term given to it and anyway, our sort of seat of emotion is kind of here and right at the back we've got the cerebellum which looks after um, heart rate and digestion and all the automatic things and um, breathing and our temperature and those sort of things our thirst when our blood, when we are angry and upset, our blood flows to the back of the brain. When we are calm and relaxed and attentive and feeling safe around people, our blood flows to the front of the brain. That means that when we're relaxed and calm and we're not traumatized, we are able to access um, logic and reason. We're able to be open to different views. We are able to share information and dialogue with people. When we are angry or upset or traumatized, or misanthropist is like in the world or disillusioned and hopeless, our blood flows to the back of the brain. And often we say, I just can't get my words out or we, we become defensive. Our blood flows to the back of the brain. Now, what is very interesting is that there is a contagion effect. So if we're around a lot of angry and upset people, we often find, gosh, they make me feel negative. Physiologically, our blood flows away from the brunt of the brain where we can even make good choices to, to, to be well and to, um, share the information. So imagine in the, in the area of veganism, when we're telling people we're upset by the information to start, so our blood is definitely going back in here, is, you know, it's, there's no logic to this emotion. We want to get out of there. It's, it's a, we want this to end. Is, and then people are saying, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Or they start to come back with this with a bit of science of why they need to eat what they eat. If our blood is at the back of the brain, and even though we're calm and relaxed and we've got this professional front, we have the potential to move their blood to the back of the brain, which means they will be defensive. OK, and this is a great science catching up with common sense that you know, if we want to change the world, we change ourselves. But if we can truly grasp that and we can put into practice strategies that very quickly move us to the front. OK, and we can do that by regular self-care, then we have the potential, even though they're resisting us because at some level, People resist vegans. They know what's going on. If not, why would they bother? They just say, you make your choice. But they don't. They laugh. They ridicule. They resist. They, we have big industries trying spending a lot of money to make people go along with this. When, but we want to bring their blood to the front of the brain so they are open to engaging with the emotional connection of the suffering, also with the science, also with the environmental issues, by us hooking them, pulling them in to the topics they are interested in and want their answers, questions answered, whether it's health or social justice or environment. And then we can segue it into the real thing it's about, which, of course, is a philosophy of the non-use and exploitation of animals. Now, how are we going to do that? We've got to kind of rewire our brains in many ways. Now, we could spend a whole week on neuro, neuro, neuroscience, really. But whenever we, whatever we do, in fact, as we're talking at the moment, our, fire, our brains are firing and wiring, little neurons in the brain, like little light bulbs that are going off. But connections get made. So when we're in a negative state and we're, you know, bemoaning the state of the world and will it ever change? And, oh, my family are driving me mad because they insist that they need meat for protein or something. The fact that we're thinking about it, talking about it, our blood flows to the back of the brain, serotonin. Um, Cortisol and adrenaline sort of negatively goes into our body in a fight or flight reaction. And literally, we set up a little circuitry of our physiological condition, our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations. It's like a little circuitry. So we only have to think back to the conversation with the family that resisted seeing earthlings. We only have to get a flash of an image on social media. And then our body feels it again. We have to think it, see it, remember it, and our body gets rewired to actually feel it as if it's happening again. This is where we get that trauma. However, it also fires and wires when we feel positive things. So if we can train ourselves to move from that place 
of limitation to abundance and health and self-care, and most importantly, visioning a vegan world, then we are going to be in a much more uh, empowered state. So how are we going to do that? Firstly, become aware. We have ups and downs all the time. We have the normal things of life we've pointed out, and then we throw dystopia on the top. Okay, we're living in a non-vegan world and we're reaching a tipping point and we are seeing more darkness the more light we show on this, tread on this. So we've got to become aware of what our thought patterns are. Are we negative? Are we, are we bemoaning other vegans? Are we seeing the million dollar vegan thing about the Pope and then making a social media post and saying, I don't believe we should be doing this. This is reductionism. Anything where we are negatively impacting something, nothing wrong with having our views. We stay in an existential position that go, okay, maybe there's something I don't know here and ask questions. Our whole physiology is going to be more open to finding solutions that are not antagonistic or causing re resistance in other people. We've then got to find a way to extinguish those associations between those thought, feelings, reactions and stress hormones and create neural pathways that, are, that actually release serotonin and oxytocin, trust and hope and and these sort of things. Now, I wouldn't be sharing this with you unless I had powerful strategies that I put into place every day to keep me living in a world at which I can not only imagine the, the living in a vegan world, it's actually being in a vegan world. Because we only, once we visualize that, we can actually create the physiological state that would exist with the happy hormones. It's not to be naive here, because also we are starting to resonate with other people. And I think that's why we're starting to see a growth in veganism, because it's sort of in train what we call in training to that place. We have to become aware of what's going on within us, do our own homework for, first so that we feel we're resonating in part of the solution. Um, and then, of course, we'll be able to be a, an instrument for change. So there's a couple of things we won't be able to do both of them. And I've got lots of resources that I'll get you to catch up with later. And some of you may have seen some of this before. I wholeheartedly recommend people learn to meditate. OK, when we've got a really busy mind, when we're anxious, when we've got a lot of stress, some, some of you will be doing undercover work. Others will be setting up small businesses. Um, other people are taking to the street and having to repeated look, look at that material that hurts us so much. Um, you know, whether us work full time in animal social justice, you know, we are even when we have good strategies, our body is registering it because it's traumatic. We, we are hardwired actually to not to be empathic. The world is. There's all sorts of evidence for that. We're not hardwired for cruelty. We're hardwired for empathy, actually. And this has been stomped out of us in many ways. So we're going to learn to meditate. I'm going to send you some, you're going to have some links after this that you can, I've got a, a lovely meditation, about 15 minutes, a guided visualization of bringing our state to a state of relaxation and then visualizing a world that we want to create but then actually teaching our bodies emotionally what it feels like to be in that future now. So I spend regular time in meditation is visualizing what it's going to be like when I can just walk down the road, go into any shop. Um, there's abundance. There's not competition. There's you can go in and don't have to ask what's in the, the dishes or only as most many of us do just only go to those vegan restaurants. We we're not worried about what is behind each of those consumer choices. You can imagine that and you can bring your body to feel what it will feel like in the future. It doesn't this make us feel warm and fuzzy? I'll share with you some of amazing research in a moment that that is actually affecting physical matter in the outside world. But emotional freedom is something. So the meditation is the first thing is emotional freedom technique. And that's known as the tapping technique. Now, I'm also Leah, a little bit aware of time and I've got a demonstration actually in a video that I'm just going to show you a link in a moment. But basically, it's a, it's really, and I'm sure we might have some people that are professionals in acupressure or acupuncture here, techniques that are certainly med and acupuncture is 10,000 years old, is looking at meridians in the body. But basically, when we're emotional, whether it's say it's negative from where I we feel frightened or we're fear or we're we're anguished by what we know is going on in the world. Are, it's a very visceral physical experience. And if we just try to sort of change our thoughts and do visualizations and positive affirmations, as important as they are, we must bring the body on the journey. I see meditation is a more relaxed way of unconsciously bring, bringing our experience to be what we want it to be without distracting ourselves, teaching our body emotionally. Emotional freedom technique is when you are suffering potentially from burnout, where you're 
you're moving to that place where your body is holding on to that deep trauma, emotional freedom technique is where we identify the emotion and then we tap on certain parts of the body whilst we're repeating. Although I am feeling fear, anxiety or hatred of the human race, I love, honor and respect myself. In the interest of time, I won't go right through it now. But we tap on the different parts which are acupuncture professionals would say was on different parts relating to different parts of the body but in, in doing that we are making contact with the body we then say and you'll be absolutely amazing slow down the breathing and i'll do it in, in the little video i'm going to send you is we slow our bodies down we go through that you'll be absolutely amazed people say i feel calmer because what you've done you've joined the body you've made contact rather than just staying in the head and saying, although I'm feeling that, I'm not going to fade it or fix it and try to pretend it's not happening, shove it down and it becomes depressed. I'm going to let it pass through my body. We then choose the emotion we want. I feel I want to feel calm. I want to feel empowered. I want to feel hopeful. You choose the words because those words have physiological, hormonal thought associations peculiar to you. And so when you say it, but you then tap on the body and say, although I'm feeling frightened or fearful, whatever you've chosen to move from, but I choose to feel hopeful, energetic, calm. You are literally anchoring into the body that connection so that, for instance, overwhelm is an emotion I would feel a lot, as many of us do, and we're active in so many things. I don't have to go through the tapping of all these different meridians in my body because I've taught my body over years to move from one place to another. Different words, but from a limiting one to a limited uh, abundant one so i will just go here and say i'm choosing to feel calm focused and relaxed and i can physiologically move myself there you can do it too and it's if we don't we depress it in the body we try to imagine it's not happening so what i'm going to um if you just go to my website veganpsychologist.com there's a little course there um goes over several lessons about six lessons in it. it's a free program called essential skills for vegan advocacy there's a download on emotional freedom technique which is the tapping therapy, but also I do a video and I show you the way to actually pull it through in your body. I encourage you to do that because you're moving from one state to another without distracting yourself. Then on that site, you'll also see, because it will come up for you, the meditation. So there's two strategies we can use to deal with our immediate dystopia is to, and then with it, of course, goes, and there's other strategies and lots of little free programs there, is obviously diet, exercise, downtime, getting enough sleep, a whole food plant-based diet. These are all things that are going to resource us to deal with what is a challenging revolution, really. Um, but there's no bad news for our non-vegan population. We are selling them a solution, an ideology, a, a way of life that they don't even know they need, but it's going to solve all their problems. So it's pretty cool, really. Okay, so do go and access that. I'm sorry if I did rush over a little bit through that. Okay, let's have a quick look at our second one. Is um, I'll probably talk about 10, 15, 20 minutes more, if I may, before we open up. Okay, now, right. so in, ter in terms of us looking at this whole notion of we're coming to this new reality, we're vegan, we're animal activists, and this dystopia, which is normal and predictable and desirable. Anybody who finds out about what's really going on in the world and the horrific cruelty we experience with animals, um, in which will be part of us to end this, um, of course, normal and predictable. We need the self-care strategies to work through that. Now, what about what else is going on here? Because so many people want to say, well, you know, on one hand, we've got all this great new news coming through. We've got, you know, these wonderful new products coming on to the market. Um, but, you know, I'm scrabbling to do a job I don't even like, or I don't really want to do this work. You know, I just want to put a roof over my head. You know, the system is kind of set up, and I call it socioeconomic slavery, as so many people do. And that's not to be negative. But it's actually realized the system is there for people to be part of an economic system. What veganism is inviting us to do is to come into our creative solutions, to be part of an abundant world. It's not just about the non-cruelty towards animals. It's about creating a thriving, abundant community of people who can learn to live lives not of quiet desperation. Now, a lot of when we look at, you know, businesses are resisting the meat and agricultural industries, the dairy industries, you know, are resisting. We've always done it like this. Industrialists have a lot to lose on this. And, and farmers, some of which may have a lot of money, others who are just scrabbling to, to maintain a living and put a roof over their family, is they are dealing with this whole notion of 
what am I going to do? If we change this, I won't be able to do this. Now, I want to put this in there because we, in understanding the context of people changing to veganism or thinking, I just can't even take on another problem, I'm trying to, is all of us have a relationship with money. Now, this can also fuel our dystopia because we've seen so much greed around um, the, the misuse of money. Money can be used for great evil. It can also be used for great abundance. And we know VEG funds is a fantastic example of when money becomes an instrument of change. We know what we can do and we can, you know, become, you know, put real solutions out there. But I want you to, after this exercise today, is to look at your relationship with money. Money is neutral. It's paper and coin. We don't even see it as that these days. We see it on computer screens and the phones. But actually, it's neutral. OK, so I want you to do a little four stage exercise, which will get to your beliefs beyond beliefs. So I, perhaps we can look. I can't see the chat at the moment, Leah, but perhaps you can actually just check in on that and we'll be able to see it with each other is I want you to finish the sentence. Money is now, the first thing I was brought up to believe when I was a child and gone to Sunday school and things. Money is the root of all evil or the love of money. But just answer that question. Money is money doesn't grow on trees. We hear money is. You know, you will if you just continue that sentence many times in your homework after this, you start to find out some of your associations. Money is good. Money is evil. Money is, you know, we don't need it. Money is it doesn't matter. It's neutral. It's the beliefs you put onto it and then do the exercise. Money is not money is not everything. Money is not going to bring me happiness. Money is not everything. However, I want a roof over my head. You're whenever we come across things like new business initiatives in the vegan area or we see the pursuit of profit without any responsibility, all these beliefs are behind it. So you doing some homework behind this, taking an existential view is that we uniquely create this. So we do an exercise, money is, and just do lots of bullet points, money is not. And then I have the relationship with money I have because, okay? And you will put those down too. I have the relationship with money I have, you might say, because I see so much greed in the world and I don't want to be part of it. Or I have the relationship with money because I know that in with it can be used for great consciousness raising to, you know, we give a million dollars to the Pope to a charity. Look at the amount of everybody's talking about veganism. OK, it's a neutral tool. And then your last one is I don't have the relationship with money I would like because I don't have the relationship with money because 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm not earning enough or. I can't get over the fact that, you know, it's used for bad things, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But I want you, because when you look at new solutions and you're evaluating initiatives that are out there, your view of money is going to affect that. It's money, I say, is a spiritual journey. Um, and there's lots of models that I'm also interested in living in a world without money. And I think we need to head towards that. So all of us have really, really, I don't think people even want money. They don't even want financial independence. They actually want to be free. Now, a lot of vegans, of course, and animal activists are, they would say, if only I had the money, I could do this. And I want to encourage us. Of course, there's wonderful initiatives like veg funds. But whatever you want to do, begin it now, is someone else has the money, but someone else has the resources. We can swap resources. We can, we give of our, so much of our volunteer time. Of course we do. But, but a lot of people spend a lot of time doing the things they don't want to do in order to be free. Okay, now. In a bigger webinar, I'd love to embrace a whole new way of being, which is called contributionism. And I'd love you to all look at Michael Tellinger's work because a vegan contributionist world. Imagine a world without money that wasn't a, wasn't communist, wasn't socialist. All of each have their merits, I guess. But it's actually about it's not it's not a commune. It doesn't say people have to have a specific religious belief to be here. But it is about us sharing our gifts in a way that is sustainable and abundant. It covers our key areas of living so that we can be the creative selves we need to be to be part of the solution. So I hope I'm, 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 I feel I'm going a little around the houses here because I can't actually see you and I feel I'm talking to a camera, but hopefully it's giving us some food for thought is reason I want you to come to terms with how you feel about work and money and what you're doing. And rather than separating, that's my work and that's my um, my philanthropic work is because there's always opportunities for us to be connecting with people and sharing our message is in, in the Vistopia book. One of the I have a whole chapter on say, well, how deep is this lovely rabbit hole <laughs> you know, what image here is because once we have opened our eyes to things, we are asking questions and there's areas on each of these. And so, for instance, people will come back to us and they will have fixed views on all of this. Look at the enormous power the medical profession has. 
to tell people what to eat or to say what causes illnesses. These are all fixed positions of people. I'm saying not choosing because it is not choosing because most people aren't looking any further than what they're told. That means they're not choosing. They're saying, oh, this is how it is. I can trust that thing and whatever. And we know through films like What the Health that it challenges. Um, we know that what is behind a lot of these business initiatives, these non-vegan um, initiatives or politics, economics, religion, um, environment studies is actually a lot of deception for people. And of course, once we've un uncovered that veil is when you do a little bit of homework any of these and you have examples of where people have been proven wrong. What the health, for instance, challenges that, you know, bodies that we believe to be robust, like heart, heart associations and diabetes associations that would be relying on science are actually taking large amounts of money from sponsors to tell the public to eat the opposite of what we know is making them sick. So uh, opposite of what, sorry, what would make them sick if they eat that. Um, when you have some more evidence, your conversations are going to be more robust. Not only does that make us put our head in our hands, of course, we then need to take it and do something with it to wake up people who have said, that's just how it is. You know, they wouldn't lie to us. The government won't do that. Medicine won't, you know, they're robust scientists. OK, so if I had a whole day, I'd go through each of these. And I've got examples in my Vestopia book to give people robust examples of where, you know, we, we have people, we come to believe certain things and people say, yep, that's how it is. I've seen the news. I've read this. I've seen the science. And we can say, well, actually, there was a time when people believed this. But look at this. If that is the case there, I'm inviting you to embrace another way of being. In other words, we're breaking their trance generally about their fixed positions, and then we're inviting them into, into, into veganism. Okay, so I'm taking a bit of a different take on this today, a bit of a all-encompassing one. I hope it's giving us something. And most of us, of course, think, oh, beam me up. I just really don't want to live in this world. <laughs> I can't be here. And because they're finding that they're, the problem is too big. Now, my, I think it was Gandhi who said, if you want to think something small can't make a difference, try going to bed with a mosquito tonight. So whatever we are doing, whether we're making, you know, we're doing a bake off or we're doing a cupcake challenge or we're making a documentary, all of us are resonating and becoming part of a solution. And there's some really interesting models, which I will get to in a few moments to try and show us that people are becoming vegan and coming to this awareness without even hearing any information. It's what we call the collective unconscious. And it's also forcing us out of our Newtonian scientific view to start to look at the quantum field, because that is really exciting because it's scientific evidence, but it's embracing a new way of being that is challenging us that actually thought can affect matter. And I'll share, I'll give you lots of research to be doing. So we're trying to break free from the chains. So in terms of these strategies, when we see if you're in a job that you don't want to do and you're doing that during the day and you're, you're doing these wonderful initiatives at night or you've been able to find a, an area that is able to keep you um, doing this full time um, well, you'd like to do more is there's always firstly opportunity for advocacy. There definitely is. But look at ways in which you can increase your freedom within this existing system. OK. And one of the things that I really encourage as a solution is minimalism. OK. Minimalism is not. Um, Scarcity, it's actually, you know, putting real value on things and not having more than we need. And these are two dear friends of mine in Australia have written this wonderful book called The Minimalist Vegan. And I encourage you to do that. You know, just looking at um, I've uh, part of every webinar, I have three beautiful animals in the background, beautiful family members um, all three very large rescue dogs. So they've just come to say hi. But I'm really encouraging you to. So, for instance, I make my own oat milk. <laughs> I decided that I didn't want 30 cartons going into landfill because I wasn't convinced they were going to be recycled properly. So I make my own oat milk, make my own toothpaste <laughs> I, because, you know, I don't want all this plastic. Um, it also makes a set, very sense of wholesomeness is repairing our clothes, not buying the things we don't need. And I know I'm preaching a, a lot to the converted here, but just review your life and just say, where am I not? optimizing where am I not because if we look at money as opportunity where can we use that to better use where can we make our lives more simple so that it's not only financial money it's our time and our energy there's different budgets here but have a look at these sort of things put your own house in order through the self-care but also 
physical practical strategies that are going to help you be more empowered and have more choice to be spending time on the things you want to spend them on all right leah how are we doing on time are we doing good i'll zip through these to give us something and please just make an idea of some sort of questions you have um it's sure. difficult when i can't see you and i hope you're i'm giving you something of real value no there. i know yeah. it's okay you can you can hear it well leah yeah, everything's good. Yeah, I would say go ahead. We've, we've received a few questions, but maybe um, take a few more slides and then I can open it up to some of the questions that we've received. Perfect. I tell you what, I'll just do this little small one here and I'll leave the last one. Um, so the key thing is we're part of a bigger system. Now, have a look at that meditation that you'll be able to access off that site. But also it's because there's some really cool stuff that we're finding is actually telling us that how people think and when they meditate, particularly when they bring their slow down their brain waves and they bring their body into alignment, people may do meditation already, but have a look at some of the transcendental meditation studies. When they've done very large studies, so 10,000 people, you know, focused and meditating on peace in a certain area at a certain time, it is highly correlated with reductions in crime, theft, violent crimes, um, physical natural disasters and when they stop the meditation it goes up again now a little bit of criticism was leveled at that which basically said but well, that's only a correlation we can find correlations between lots of things you know one thing goes up one goes up or down it's correlations and so this is really cool and I really want us to be inspired by this so it's not only we're doing this for our own sake to have our self-care have a look at the peaceful cities project now this was research scientific research in the 80s and 90s that showed the unexpected effectiveness of meditation in approach to peace in preventing social violence when it was conducted on US cities, it prevent, in preventing terrorism and war when conducted on behalf of cities affected by armed conflict. Now, I'm sorry, that's a big mouthful. What they did, they were to get large numbers of people focusing together. So they have a group of people that were focusing they, they taught them how to meditate. They taught them how to slow their brain waves down. They measured where their brain waves were down into alpha and down into slowing down. And they got their bodies into that place. And when they focused, say, on peace in East Chicago, and I'm just choosing an area, they found it was cause and effect that when they that when the times when they meditated on specific peace in that area, there was a reduction in violent crime and in war areas, there was a reduction in attacks. When they took it away, it went up. And they, this wasn't co correlations, it was literally cause and effect. Now, don't believe me on that. There are 23 scientific research studies been published, and you've got a little piece there called the peacefulcities.org projects. Go and have a look at that and be inspired. So it says that time that you take out for your own self-care and, and self-awareness, not just going to make you feel calmer and more able to do the work you need to do, but we are starting to resonate with the outside world. Now, that's really cool because we don't want the infighting between the vegan groups. We don't want to be attacking other people because they're more welfareist than abolitionist is because when we do negativity, we're feeding negativity. We have our place. We are our position. We are our beliefs. But when we are generous in how we treat other people, then it's going to be really cool because we're affecting the outer world. All right. Um, Leah, do you want us to stop for a moment and take some questions before I look at the, the challenges of the recidivism rates, which I'm also going to debunk some of those myths? Would you like to open up something? I feel I've been talking a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No. And um, first, thank you for bearing with our technical difficulties, Claire, and sorry that we took some of your time. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, we we agreed that uh, vegans are very kind and forgiving people. So <laughs> hopefully be, you'll all be understanding um, this is clearly a huge topic and one that requires all of us taking it home and really thinking about it. And, and I appreciate you offering us that homework and we'll definitely make sure to, to share the links and things that you've alluded to throughout the presentation. Um, somebody asked, um, they mentioned vegans are often pressurized to really hide their deep grief, especially when we're out doing uh, activism. Uh, how do you handle disenfranchised grief, which I think is a great great idea great great phrase a, a disenfranchised grief grief oh, yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um it's interesting you're saying they're almost encouraged to do that i guess you know if we're out doing street activism or talking to people and and we're falling all over the place they're going to say oh gosh don't tell me about that i don't want to be feel like that i guess is do you know it's really i think grief is a it's definitely something we deeply suffer from when we when we look at um 
what grief is in a sense of loss a sense of pain and, and agony and, and depression and disbelief uh, the burden of knowing really is i think it's about getting our own house in order is the information we know is never going to be okay you know we can i after 10 years you know i still see things as we all do and our we, we can really sink when we put good strategies into place, an emotional freedom technique is one of them to bring us back to that place of calm. And it doesn't mean we're trying to distract ourselves is, you know, for instance, if I was if we say um, we're feeling a deep sense of grief and loss and, and just the pain of those images and what we know is behind closed doors, doing something like emotional freedom, although I feel this deep thing, you can find that emotions will come up. And therefore, in daily practice, you can be there in tears. And, and I think a lot of us block our tears. Um, or we see so much, we feel gutted, we feel sick, but it doesn't come up as tears. Now, there's a real reason for crying. The tears cried in grief and pain are chemically different than those cried in laughter. So it's also, I think, social support's important, is talking to other people, sharing the deep grief with people that understand. But then moving on from that to say, how can we transmute that into powerful action for change? But make time to grieve, okay? If you're in a conversation with someone in the public and you become emotional, um, you know, don't apologize for that. You say, um, whoa, can you just give me a moment? I've, I've, I'm sure what I'm sharing with you, it deeply hurts me. And I don't apologize for that because it is very, and actually it needs to hurt all of us. Um, what I'd like to do is talk to you, or you can be part of the solution that we don't even have to, to, to even go and show these videos anymore because it stops. Yeah. So it's definitely doing things ourselves, the social support, um, this, the, the meditation, the emotional freedom technique is keeping a journal for many people, but it's moving into a place. You've got to find a way to deal with that. Um, being around sanctuary, sanctuaries are wonderful, animal sanctuaries, and I know they're bittersweet sometimes because we see, well, these animals, okay, what about the others? When we focus on that as well, we are resonating with the world we want to create for all animals, and we remind ourselves of the work we're doing and the imperative that we need to keep going. Has that answered the question, do you think, Leah? I, I think so. I appreciate you saying we need to take time to grieve. I think so many of us mm -hmm. as activists, we feel this urgency to to be out there and be making sure everybody knows what we know and to share it tomorrow, if not yesterday. And we do need to take that time for ourselves to, to carry that yes. burden that we carry. Yeah, I think um, you're right. And another thing I would say, because I shared that thing about neuroscience, when we're in grief and we're in pain, our blood is moving away from our the front of our brain. So we, we become tongue tied even. And we stay in that fight or flight and just existing position. In sl firstly, slow down your breathing. In all grief, we're in panic of fear and we're under threat or lost something very dear and we're, these animals are losing their lives, is slow down your breathing. You know, when we're in shock, we take a deep breath in and our sympathetic nervous system kicks into play. And it is sympathetic to the fact we're under stress. And so all our little fight or flight reactions go on, you know, we're blood's going away from the brain and we're going, I've got to get out of here. And yet we want to be there for the animals. So we stay in that place of, you know, of challenge. That so many resist. When we breathe out and we slow our breathing down, which we do in meditation, and relaxation, we activate the parasympathetic nervous system that brings us into balance. So I do it where I breathe and I visualize the blood coming to the front and I use self-soothing language. I heard you word to a, a young child or a friend when you put your arm around them and say, it's going to be OK. Just take a few deep breaths. You know, we're doing something about this. It's going to be OK. When I see, um, you know, I've had, I've watched Dominion three times. I've emceed it three times. And the third time, I think it took me two weeks to get over it because it just hurt me so much. A strategy I have is the animal who caught my eye, the animal we see in the cage is no longer in pain. Yes, we know the billions of others are. But that one, they're not, you know, just you bring it down to that level. Energize yourself. To, yeah, I've got to get these other ones out of there. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about the challenges of being in a relationship with somebody who's not as vegan as you are or even vegan at all. And um, somebody else talked about the loneliness of being an outlier in so many circles. Um, they've yeah. taken the, the pledge to not eat at a table where others' bodies are being consumed. It can be very isolating. Um, and hard to know, should you be in a relationship with somebody who's not vegan in any capacity? Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I talk with vegans all over the world. And in that research, there was there's people that have lived with a non-vegan for 20 years. 
my personal view is, I don't know how they do that, and I take my hat off to them, um, is others that have someone who is a plant-based person, but they don't share the deep anguish they feel. Another person who, you know, I've, I know a lot of people that when they become vegan, their partner doesn't. Um, and that causes huge problems. Um, so sometimes people learn a strategy to say this person's kind and compassionate and I can accept we don't do this in our house and outside. And that's not a judgment on people at all. I, I personally couldn't do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I understand when we're in a relationship and we, we, we become vegan or you do male or female or whatever relationship, type of relationship we're in and our partner doesn't is we're with them for a reason. They're obviously kind and generous in lots of ways. Hopefully I wouldn't be with them. And sometimes it's about expanding that um, window of compassion and finding things they are compassionate about, finding what I call the hooks, I we hook thing them in, I think of coat hooks, we hook something on. So if they're concerned about, look, we can't, you know, it's all right, you being vegan, but I don't want to feed our children on that because what about their health? They're asking about health and energy and what should I have responsibility? They'd be a negligent parent if they didn't ask, or they want to be healthy. Speak to the health, give them evidence. There's evidence to debunk every anti-vegan uh, discussion is share that with them. Now, I know I'm giving you strategies you probably already tried, but when you're in an emotional context of a relationship, you know, it's, it's more difficult. Our family aren't as polite often. They will say and do things and not speak to us for weeks and get away with it, which people in the public won't be able to do. So firstly, find the hooks and get your own house in order so you now know that your blood needs to be at the front of the brain and use very, um, and I've got another free strategy for your moment called Vegan Voices if you don't already have it, how to talk about veganism in a, in a, um, on all sorts of issues, a little video program, is um, learn to communicate more, is actually don't do all the heavy lifting, is with your partner if they're there, because the reason I'm, I'm going to the solutions is because you obviously want them to be vegan. It's never going to be okay that they're not. You might have agreements that there's no animal products in your house, but it hurts you that they go out and eat with people at lunchtime and, and they partake of that. So you're trying to nudge them into that awareness. And so, um, you know, talk to their concerns, give them the evidence and invite them by asking. Don't do all the heavy lifting. Ask them the questions themselves. You know, can you explain to me? I'm really struggling. What is it that makes you resist veganism so much? What is it you like about eating what you eat? Don't ask why. Why gets defensiveness? What gives the information? All right, that's really important. And then we can segue in the other things. Um, it's really very difficult being with certainly a non-vegan partner because there's more of a, you know, spend a lot more of your time together. Um, ultimately, you have to choose. Um, there is a deep loneliness that has been mentioned in this question. Um, and really loneliness, we can be alone and not lonely. It's when we really don't feel, we don't feel we belong anymore. We don't feel seen. Oh. So it's really important as Cosmo asserts, is to be and find your family. And for some people, that's they live in an area where it's only online. If you can connect with other people that are part of the solution, that will resource you and you can talk about strategies and how to do this. Ultimately, in the intimate relationship, we need to decide um, and to invite them into that solution, fan those compassionate waves they already have, um, and and and, and move in that direction. Does does that help, Leah? Do you think it's hard to answer that one sometimes with a lot of it choice is, there? It is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, somebody mentions that they don't know if they'll ever be able to find somebody who understands, um, and that the isolation can be numbing. But I know, you know, maybe it's not the same. But Veg Fund offers uh, an online community, and I know you are you have the Vistopia group on Facebook, which I find immensely helpful. And, and there are communities out there, you know, we're lucky to live in a, in a world where there is online access to those people. Do you, do you recommend, you know, reaching out in those ways in order to, to help combat some of that isolation? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, if we get to it in a few, you know, we might have five minutes in a moment to look at yeah, the, go um, ahead. no, that's right. And we'll have a look in a second is, um, is definitely connect with other people on social media you know and that's another little bit i think i'll try and get to it even if we do it very quickly is trying to um we get upset by this awful thing that happens is infighting now it's because people are in pain when we process our grief when we become generous to other people when we live in an existential awareness and i know i've done a really one-on-one -on -one sort of class today but it literally instead of us saying this is how it is you shouldn't do that i can't believe you're like that we're fixing things where we get out of that, we live in the question. 
is ask people, hey, I'm struggling to understand why you've just had a go at my friend Leah over there, and maybe there's something I'm missing. And can you give me some more information? You know, that's a, it becomes a more collegiate way rather than saying, how dare you do that? Their blood goes to the back of the brain and we're in a conflict before we know it, all right? Um, you know, the lovely news is that person will ever find someone is we're growing in veganism. You know, it's um, there is no doubt that this is the time in our history when we really have to step up our activism. I think that's very important is and there will be more vegans around. So the good news is you won't be um, trying to access people from a very limited pool. That's very important. But, um, are there any other pressing questions or shall I just give us a little bit of hope on this recidivism rate? And I'll tease in some of the items that you've raised as well. Yeah, I think that would be great if you can if you can do that. All right. OK. Now, there's a lot of people that say, um, oh, my gosh, um, you know, Claire, you've just said, oh, it'd be nice for me to find a partner and whatever. Um, and they're all growing. But is it? There's all these recidivism rates, as Cosmo is a little concerned about. OK. Now, there's been celebrities in the press recently and they say, gosh, you know, um, I've gone back to being non-vegan. And for people who are their only community is online is that that becomes our family we think how is that possible people i looked up to and they're no longer vegan now there was a lovely um video done by on the first of february by dr garth davis he was in forks over knives a, a plant-based doctor and he says really you know how serious is this um and he talks about the fact that you've got to be aware that people um they're often getting paid by large corporations to actually do this to say oh i felt so ill i needed to go back and eat this is people are fallible you know, not just with veganism. You think of news resolutions. People don't stick to them because their habits are so ingrained in, you know, deeply and entrained. So number one, is it as bad as we think? I want to give you some hope here. Now, the studies that are often looked at is the faunalytics, wonderful Joe Anderson's work, is look at these things that resonate those questions. 63% of people said they dislike their dislike that their diet made them stick out from the crowd. You're not alone in this. OK, 49 percent, they in, insufficient interaction with other people, which, you know, we feel lonely. You know, we've got to find our tribe sort of thing. I know when I, I need to be around other vegans and particularly animal rights campaigners, because it makes me feel really, gosh, there's such an amazing stuff going on. OK, you can look at this. Um, now, it was it was criticized often. People said, oh, there's 84 percent recidivism rate, i.e. people going back there. Um, but it wasn't actually said there was 84 percent said they're not actively involved in You've got to bear in mind that this research done by Faunalytics was vegetarian and vegan groups. And we know that those groups are very different. <laughs> OK, um, and so already it gave us not quite, you know, it's not just vegans going back to this. However, I want to look at research that was done between the 90s, 1990s and 2010 that says contrary to there being 85 percent recidivism rate, um, this quite robust study was done of vegan and vegetarians. Um, I like them when they're done separately. It said that 85% between those 20 years, after 20 years, were still following their diets, whether they were vegetarian or vegan. But that in the last five years, 10 to 15, it actually has increased a little bit. People are good going, but still only 27%. So, you know, our advocacy is not in vain. When we truly share the message and we're putting out there and we give people the resources, this is the most important thing. I don't think I have enough to talk about oh, very briefly. Is it OK if I talk about these, Lisa? I don't want to use all our time. Oh, no, please go ahead. No, I think okay. this, is, this is good. I want I'm very over prepared today, but I wanted to give particularly for people that have been to my talks before. I didn't want them to get a, a rerun of, you know, but some of the key concepts I've been, they might have heard before. So now so let's think about the recidivism is OK. Maybe it's not as bad as we think. We do need some individual studies on vegans, of course. But have a look at the process of entrainment. Now, I unfortunately couldn't show a video on today's thing. After this class, go to YouTube and look at metronomes entrainment. Now, entrainment is it's really cool. You'll see them all clicking away in all different directions. And right in front of your eyes, they will go together. And there's no, it's not a trick of the eye. What this is, back in 16... 89, I believe it was, this wonderful man here with a wonderful hair, Christian Huygens, came across a, full, a process that he named entrainment. Now, this is really cool when we look at veganism and to give us hope. It's, it, um, entrainment is where two or more oscillating bodies synchronize over time. Now, he found that concepts in biology, chemistry, botany, architecture, engineering, wherever you've got oscillating bodies, things and he found out first through grandfather clocks. And he had a 
tens of grandfather clocks he to set up as experiments, all the pendulums going at different rates. And over time, he suddenly realized they all went together. This is called entrainment. These bodies oscillate over time to synchronize together. Now, this is really cool because we know this happens in society too. The question is, at the moment, the world is entraining to a very dark um, tune, really, which is a dystopian world. They have entrained to eat meat three times a day. They have been duped into drinking the reproductive secretions of animals, which is when they really get it, they go, my goodness, how did that happen? It is entraining to what is normal. The existential position is they're no longer choosing. <laughs> they think they're choosing, but they're choosing from a tiny diet of choices. When we, we are starting to entrain to a different tune. So imagine all the metronomes going in one direction into a bad tune. We're over here, our little metronome moving over here, our grandfather clock. And the more we do, we want to resonate with the good stuff. So if we are be, buying into the negativity and criticizing other groups as, oh, isn't it awful? They're all going back. We are starting to entrain to that other side and it's taking time for the vegan world to come. It's starting to move as we see a growth because people don't actually choose, they go along with. Most people don't choose. The good news is that we've got to encourage people to entrain to a different tune and choose a more compassionate thing. And for many people, it'll just be conformity. All right, so it's cool sort of stuff. So let's give you some, some practical solutions, which is most important. If when we haven't got enough people in our lives, when we feel people are going back, we've got some wonderful tools. Challenge 22, of course, is that wonderful program that helps someone transition to veganism. Have these tools ready. Go, in, go on them yourself so that you know what they're like so you can share them with other people. And you say to people, you know, go and do this. Do it for a month. And then, you know, go on a whole food plant-based diet. I'll help you. And, you know, I dare you to go back afterwards because you're going to feel a million times better. You might feel a bit tired in the first few weeks. And then there's a wonderful new thing that I'm also involved in is and on the advisory um, board there is called New Leaf. And that's just come out. And there's um, on our hen house, there was a lovely podcast the other week. Have a look at that, too, because that is recruiting mentors all over the world to help people until they feel truly ready to go out into the world. So we're not, you know, we're increasing the, the, the way in which we, you know, we champion these things. So that's about and also champion the new products. Yes, some of them are going to be a little bit more expensive on the shelves. And, you know, it's not, not until we create more of the demand that the prices will come down because these you know, more ethical businesses have huge costs. They haven't got the economies of scale of some of these big organizations. We need to champion that too. Then we're in training to a very different tune. Okay, now another solution for you. I want to give you lots of solutions today. If you haven't got vegan voices, it's a free 30 day training in how to talk about all things vegan and animal social justice, the key things. Where do you get your protein? You know, um, what are we going to do? Why aren't you coming home for Christmas? The animals will overrun the world if we don't eat them. All these things. It's a short video. There's lots of resources. And you, most importantly, if you have found a video or in the resource section, a video that or a link or a talk that you know has helped someone transition into veganism, you can add it in the resource section. OK, so you can globally we're going to collaborate. And then those resources will be helped by people all over the world so they can forward it by on their phones and from their computers and to do that. Now, if you're not on a smartphone, I've just created, got somebody to create an online version and that will be on veganpsychologist.com. The resources aren't there, the, the things to forward. And you can get that on the phone, but you can certainly get the free training on, on either veganvoices.com for the phone or vegan psychologist. OK, oh, well, that's a little thing for you. So um, Leah, I'm going to do go through this as well staying with this whole notion that we are the ones we've been waiting for we're going to be trained to a different tune we're going to put a lot of work in for our own self self-care but now we've got to learn to uh, i want you to go and look at that peaceful cities project that says you know how we think how we bring our bodies into alignment with that vision we want to create is affecting physical matter but it's kind of upsetting isn't it but you know all groups go through whether we join an existing group or, you know, we come together in an AV group, a, a body that I wholeheartedly support and, and right behind them is and be part of it is all groups come together. So vegan groups are no different than any other organization or social justice movement or just interest group. We come together and we start to work together and then differences arise. And that's in deep group development is what is called storming. It's when our, you know, we start to people aren't pulling their weight or there's a differences about the focus of the projects or 
there are different you know people are being horrible to people online there's no you know they have all differences and we start to disagree with the extent of their advocacy or whether they're you know ab ab abolitionists or welfareists and we start to fall out okay i want you to know that this is normal and predictable now if we learn the tools to have difficult conversations which vegan voices and challenge 22 and all these are going to help us with and, and new leaf we will be able to talk about those differences because the groups in vegan groups that work well together doesn't mean they never fall out but they found a way to respectfully talk through this so that they can come to a stage of norming this is how we treat people this is what our group's about when we are attacking other people because we're in grief and because we're hurting about the animal suffering we are not helping ourselves to get it to a group that is fully performing functional that we can truly call our family all right i can do it on another webinar sometime but i want to give you some don't get disillusioned when there's a lot of fighting but choose where you're going to be part of it if we get in there and or we withdraw and put our hands up in despair and say oh this is just some bad people they're hurting too most people are pretty good they're just frustrated and hurt there are some people that want to cause problems don't buy into it okay and be respectful online be generous ask questions but also find your tribe and if you find it's one that you really don't resonate with be around people that make you feel your best and but also you know be the example you want to be for them doing that all right so in closing is my thing and i'd love to take a few more questions if we have and i know we got five minutes is it's learning how to collaborate now attend this is wonderful webinars on um, veg funds that I've been looking at some of them, some how to talk to people that don't want to listen. There's a previous one on communication I wholeheartedly recommend. And um, I do a, a monthly webinar series on overcoming dystopia. I have people from the SAVE movement joining us this um, on the 6th of March. You can sign up for that just on that vegan psychologist site. Is And we'll be looking at tools and strategies, you know, and work through conflict with other people. And um, these are social skills that we need in everyday life, not just in veganism constantly examine our assumptions the things that we jump to about other people um you know it's interesting i went on to um upwork the other day to find someone a graphic designer and this person was talking about you know they loved consciousness raising projects and whatever and um and they were keen to do it but they came back to me and they said you know um i can't work with you i because you're spreading vegan propaganda you know um my particular culture in romania has evolved to have to eat meat and I cannot ethically put my name to your project, <laughs> which I thought, which, you know, which made me smile a little. Now, I can make huge assumptions about that person. I could go back and be very rude to them, or I can be an invitation for change and actually um, use words like we. OK, gosh, I'm a little disappointed you can't do that. Do you know, we've all been duped and we've all been told lies and our cultures and traditions affect us. And um, let me invite you to look at ABC. All right. So when we do that and we become more generous, we the person's got nothing to fight against and push and say, oh, that person was rude because I said I couldn't work with them. Um, or they think they're trying to get their opinion over mine. You know, learn to become that great communicator so that you can walk away from every conversation knowing that you could look the animals in the eye and go, I did my best today. Sometimes I mess up, but I did my best for you. All right. Learn to be generous in creating that, us creating that vegan world. I've got time to talk about that one. But truly, um, learn to collaborate with people. There's lots of fantastic resources online. You can certainly share some of mine. I've got a moving picture in the background, which is a collaborative project doing a little building project there. Is, you know, do some research on how to set up good groups, normal group dynamics, so that you can truly be around people that, you know, we can, if we want to go quickly, we go on our own. We want to go far, we have to collaborate. We are actually all on the same side here. There's different paths to get there. So let's do our bit and be part of ushering in this great new vegan world. OK, I'll stop there, Leo, if I may. And uh, I'll just smooth that on a little bit. If no, I that's may. wonderful. Uh, great. And if, I'm just so trying we, to get we did receive one. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, no, not we at did receive one question that um, uh, that I think would kind of sums up what you were just talking about. Somebody mentions, unfortunately, some important discussions in the AR movement are shut down with a critique of infighting. Um, this person talks about the Me Too movement and how it was delayed talking about it for so long because people felt they couldn't criticize within the system and, and other things that people feel they wish that they could talk about within the AR movement. So I know, you know, can you talk about strategies for how to deal with that so that it doesn't become a, you know, head-to-head -head fight, but that we can 
speak about differences that we have even within our own movement. Absolutely. Do you know, um, it's a much bigger topic, much bigger systemic sort of issue, isn't it? Is I always feel it's quite sad when people are shut down in a way because that just gets defensiveness. You know, if we, we want to be heard is really comes back to communication skills is um, I always say to people, it's these are difficult conversations. There was um, there was a, a, a title given to these conversations that are difficult, therefore people shut them down, called crucial conversations. And it's where the emotions are high, the opinions differ, and the stakes are high. Okay, and if you really look at that, that's what we're talking about here. And some of the strategies to overcome that really are whenever you want to open up a conversation with someone, often we start talking, they go, oh, we don't want to talk about that, is actually invite someone to have the conversation. Now, you may be part of groups and they may have a rule that they don't do it. You have to find your own family, of course, or find a way to do it, but not attack the people that have, have said, I don't want to talk about it, okay? It's often because they, they don't know how to deal with a conflict often, and so they shut it down. That doesn't solve anything. Is whenever we're going to do that is ask people for the conversation. So you might say, hey, look, um, I wonder if we can just literally just have a bit of discussion about the Me Too issue and its relevance in animal you know, exploitation, which is you know, we're looking at all forms of oppression here. Um, why don't we just spend 10 minutes of that and both all elect to have an open mind to discuss the platform on which we should do this. When we ask for a contract, people have the choice to say no. If they do, we'll deal with that as well. But they, when there's something happens in the brain, when someone gives you permission to have the conversation, they don't feel they're being forced or it's being foisted upon them. But when we anticipate what we think may go wrong, we say, look, you know, these are emotional issues. Can we just select that we'll stay in the conversation with open minds, with a good spirit, that we will talk about this and share our ideas without closing each other down so that we know the context in which we can have the bigger discussion. Now, that's a really good tool for... When we're talking about anything, actually, um, talking about veganism with our families and non-vegan people at work is ask for the conversation. When they say yes, we open it up. And when they suddenly realize they're busy and they try and end the conversation, you say, that's why I asked for 10 minutes. Let's come back and finish it. OK, um, and ask lots of questions, you know, be tentative. Um, you know, these are really good empathic listening skills. OK, and some of those are actually on the vegan voices and there's other forms to find that is you know, it's when we ask open ended questions, get people to explain what they mean. Say, let me share with you what I mean. What is your understanding of this? You know, we often play table tennis in conversations <laughs> um, and opening up conversations, then putting in our words what we think they've said. So look, what you seem to be saying is, you know, talking about the Me Too movement in relative of it isn't because it does or it's not. You know, am I correct? Firstly, establish what you're talking about. Challenge your assumptions in theirs and then it's getting on the same page more and, and also saying, you know, what specific is, is what's the reason? Not why won't you let me discuss it? They'll just defend themselves. What is the reason? Can you give me, you know, specifically what you think the problem will be if we open up this conversation? It stays with the information. We really find out what the fears are. And often the fears are is that it'll result in a fight and people don't know how to do it. Therefore, it gets pushed underground. Conflict is normal and predictable. It's when we work through it. That's where we get highly functioning groups. Mm. Well said. Um, well, we are just a few minutes past uh, the, the 6.30 or half hour mark, so I think we, this is a good place to, to stop, but I want you to know uh, we've had so many good comments and people um, are really excited about this webinar, and I'm happy to say the whole thing has been recorded and we will share the recording um, so that you can um, share it with your communities and, and review it again. Um, and also, you know, um, I'll make sure that we get the website that you, the websites and different resources that you've shared. Um, can we make sure that we get that sent around to, to folks um, later this week? And we'll get things from you. Thank you. Wonderful. It's uh, <laughs> we've shared a lot today, I know, and uh, I feel I've given a sort of cursory overview. But there are a lot of resources there, and I hope it's given you some hope for what you can do to yourself. And also that investment in your time is affecting the outer world. And then really to have some hope that, you know, whilst you're going to hear some doom and gloom stories and people are going back and people are, you know, keep resonating and in training at a high level. And that's where we're starting to see some massive shifts. And thank you, everyone, for everything you're doing. Um, I, don't, I can't even see you, but I'm so pleased to be part of this you know, peaceful revolution we're all part of. And the animals are going to thank us at this time in our history when our species is immense. Yes. 
Um, please take some time if you haven't. Um, my colleague Fabiola shared in the chat function the survey for today's webinar. It really helps us to know what you thought of today's webinar, what worked, what didn't, um, and so that we can continue to provide resources like this amazing resource we had today for you. And thank you so much, Dr. Claire Mann. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing and, uh, and see, you, see you online and, and see you uh, as part of the solution. Yes, absolutely. Everybody take care and um, we'll connect the next time. Have a great rest of your day.